chapter 1. And, you know, we're going to wrap up the letters to Timothy here in just there's four chapters. They're short. So in the next couple, three Sundays. Then we'll just continue to move on through the New Testament. We'll go to Titus, which is another pastoral letter. And then Philemon, one, one chapter. And we'll talk a little bit about Philemon this morning, by the way. So, let's pray. Father, we do pray for Israel. And Lord, we know there's going to be conflict in the world because the sin nature worldwide has taken over. So there's going to be wars. And that's not good. It's not good. Uh, innocent people get killed in war. But Father, we also pray for Israel because we know that the wars that they fight are based on their national survival because their enemies really want to exterminate them as a nation. So we pray for the leadership in Israel. We pray for their salvation, that they come to know their Messiah. Lord, they're far from the Messiah right now as a nation of people. So Father, we pray, and we know you love your chosen nation, Father. We know what the Bible says about their ultimate victory, but right now they're in the middle of conflict. Asking for protection and sanity. In Jesus' name. We ask that for the rest of the world, Lord. And we need a revival here in Barstow. We need a revival in America. In our individual hearts as we sit here this morning. And for this congregation, Calvary Chapel of Barstow. Father, as you're working amazing ways, especially with our youth that are coming up. We're so blessed about what's going on in our church right now. About the people that have stepped up to take leadership responsibilities and, and my elders that I meet with second Sunday of every month after church. So Father, thank you for those guys. I need them and we need them. In Jesus' name, and now we ask for your Holy Spirit to move on me as I teach the scriptures to our precious sheep. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's read the first four verses aloud together. And you know, last week I, I reviewed the YouTube <laughs> and I got lost, man. I, I didn't have my glasses on and I, my page got all fuzzy and I got lost and so everybody kept reading and reading and reading. And then I, I mentioned I should have left it alone. I should have just left it alone. But anyway, so anyway, today I'll try to read four verses and then move on. You guys let me move on to the fifth verse. It's only 18 verses. I'll read the whole chapter. Chapter 1, first, or second Timothy. Second Timothy. Chapter 1. 18 verses, we will read the first four verses aloud together, please. That means you read too. Loud enough for me to hear you. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you being minded, mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. And I'll move on. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that's in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, 
but of power and love and of a sound mind that can also be translated self-control. Therefore, verse 8, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. That's interesting. But it's now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, verse 12, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know, verse 15, that all those in Asia have turned away from me among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. And that's where Onesiphorus and he said, I can't pronounce it now, I just said it. Anisiphorus. He was a slave in the household of a man named Philemon, which is uh, one more book over after Titus. It's a one chapter book. Philemon was his owner. He, he, uh, Anisiphorus was a slave. He ran away. He sought Paul out. Paul, when he wrote 2 Timothy, was in his second imprisonment in Rome. Uh, in his first imprisonment, he was allowed to have guests in his house. He, he witnessed often and so on. And so it's probably then when Onesiphorus was able to visit him. This time around, Paul was under duress when he wrote this letter. I'm going to start back with verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Paul starts a lot of his letters this way, saying that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, a hand-picked messenger for Jesus by Jesus himself. He was not self-appointed, he was appointed by God himself. And so he was just as legit as Peter, James, and John, who were the leaders in Jerusalem. You know, Paul came along later, and. Uh, uh, quite, a, quite a bit later. So uh, he, he wasn't acknowledged originally as part of the leadership of Jerusalem until after his conversion, Jesus taught him for three years and sent him back. And then he was welcomed by those in power. And you can read about that in first and second uh, chapters of Galatians about his, uh, his being taught by Jesus for three years. To Timothy, verse 2, a beloved son, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's something that he would say those words in light of what he was going through at the time and what Timothy and others were probably going to face themselves. It was not a good time for Christians. It just wasn't. Nero had come to power. Nero was a vicious pervert. And, uh, you know, he... The rumor was that he started a fire that burned Rome and he blamed the Christians. Yes. And so that gave him license to persecute the Christians. That's legend. We don't know that for a fact, but it's possible. The grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ Jesus our Lord. He's saying those words to somebody that's going to suffer for their faith. He was. I've been saying this along as we go along and we're studying the lives of the apostles. 
they had learned. They had grown to the place where spiritually they learned how those things which are normally bad news to us can be handled with grace and love. So he says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, verse 3, that I serve, thank, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day. Uh, Paul prayed fervently. Greatly desiring, verse 4, to see you being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. So he's acknowledging the fact that Timothy is suffering, others uh, in, in the Christian world are suffering, but yet they're still rejoicing in the middle of the suffering. And that takes a while to mature spiritually to accept that and not complain about it. Amen. Amen. I say this often, we live in a culture where we're complainers. If you don't believe that, go to Walmart. And try to fight your way through that do-it-yourself line. You hear a lot of mumbling and grumbling. And you know what? I don't always do this. I, you know, I'm, I'm not this super spiritual guy. But there's times I just smile at somebody. And they may be grumpy. They may be... But sometimes just a smile, it clicks for them. You know, as they, they walk by you and they kind of do a double take. That's good for them. That's good for you. Yes. To do that, we need to bring a smile into a cr- crazy world yes. and not be on such an ego trip that we're offended by something they say or don't do toward us. The apostles had grown to the place where they understood their destiny and their purpose. Verse 5, Paul says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, it's real stuff, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. He didn't have a daddy. Some scholars think that he probably had a Greek dad, so he's a non-believer, but he might have been in the household. We don't know. But Lois and Eunice are mentioned by name. That's, and every Mother's Day we have somebody take those two ladies as an example of godly women. They raised this young man in troubled times to love Jesus. So by the time the apostle Paul comes along to kind of polish up that gem that he is becoming, uh, he's ready to be matured through the apostles' teaching. So he's ready for the, for the task of serving like in Ephesus later on. Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. It's one of the ways that uh, they would anoint somebody into service and we do that in our churches today as well. Lay hands on them, pray over them, and anoint them into service for Jesus. So Paul had done that for Timothy. So he had apostolic touching. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. I love this verse. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. And if those two things that precede that are regular in our lives, we have a sound mind. We are learning to be disciplined. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Wow. I think he says in Romans. He does say in Romans. Think about the verse 17 of chapter 8. Can't remember the exact wording. But he says... uh, that we're joint heirs with Christ, providing we suffer with him. Yes. And so I, I like the first part of that verse. We're joint heirs with Christ. Think about that. 
Yeah. We're the heirs of Christ. Uh, J Jesus is the only begotten son, so he's the rightful heir to the kingdom. But God has chosen to adopt you and I into the family. It's his choice. He looks down like I looked around this morning. And he, he stops and unqualified. Unqualified. But then he says, I'm going to adopt that person in my family. And so we become an heir. But you know, there's a catch to that. It says, if we suffer with him. Ooh. We become an heir as we suffer with Jesus. Amen. We don't suffer yet in America like they do in other countries or have in the past in Paul's day. Could happen. I pray not. Share with me the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. Who has saved us, verse 9, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which is given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. You know, I don't understand all those things where it talks about, and there's a, there's a term that's used in Christian circles, and it's controversial at times, it's called predestination which means God's predetermined a path for you and I to follow ahead of time. In fact, I think even before we were created. How could he do that? Because he's God and he knows we were coming along. But before we came along, he had a purpose for our lives. And that purpose carries with it sacrifice. And sacrifice is painful. But doable. Amen, amen. But now has been revealed, verse 10, by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We can learn to look beyond this temporary life that we're living and begin to gain the perspective of the apostles. When they were going through the suffering now, they were looking beyond. We got a mansion just over the hilltop. Amen. Amen. And when we look at eternity and compare it with now, and if we can grasp that just a little bit, we can handle the suffering that we're going to go through. Because we have perspective then. However long we suffer in this life, for whatever reason it is, nothing compared to eternity. Amen. Well, we're going to have a brand new body and no sin nature. Yes. No tendency to sin. But you know, what's the beautiful thing about God? That's what His grace and mercy come in. He chose us while we're still sinners. He, he is not surprised by your sinful past. Amen. You know, a lot of people, they come to church and think, oh boy, you know, I'm such a sinner, I don't belong there, or them holy joes are going to look down at me. And I look around and uh, I don't know everybody's testimony here, but we've got a few the last two Fridays, by the way. That, that's kind of exciting. Uh, but some of you are a mess, you know. I don't know what I'm doing associating with you. But then I don't know why you associate with me either. Praise God for his grace and mercy, and he chose us beforehand. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Our lifestyle did not surprise God. Verse 9, he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, 
but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That's what we look forward to. It ain't going to last forever. To which I was appointed a preacher, verse 11, an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. You don't have to turn back to Acts if you don't want to, but you can if you would like. I'm going to do that. Um, Paul was called initially to the Jew first. He says that in Romans 1, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. But there was a time when the, Gentile, or the Jews rejected him, flat out rejected his ministry. Turn with me back to the book of Acts to your left, to chapter, oh man, I had a bookmark, where is it? Yeah, chapter 13, verse 46, specifically. I'll start with verse 44, so it just kind of moves into that 46 verse. Acts, chapter 13, reading from verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. So when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, check it out, they grew bold. By the way, one of the benefits of being filled with the Holy Spirit is boldness to share the gospel. The power to share the gospel. <clears throat> Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It is necessary, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, talking to the, Gen the Jews. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, that's heavy stuff, man. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. That's where the turn came in his ministry. The ministry always is to the Jew first and also the Gentile. It's not discriminatory. It's just that he has a heart for his Jewish people that have abandoned him over all these years. He wants to see him come back. Yes. One of the reasons why he offers uh, salvation to the Gentiles so the Jews get jealous of that. He says that in Romans chapter 11. To provoke them to jealousy so they'll come back to me and, and repent of their sins. At this point, Paul's ministry wasn't happening. For so the Lord, verse 47, has commanded us, I set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for, that you should be for the salvation of the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles, verse 48, heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. The Gentiles, those lousy, stinking pagans, Coming out of that Roman and Greek culture where just about everything went, sexually and everything else, it was a horrible time. Kind of reminds me of America today. I watch probably too much TV. Pray for your pastor. He's a heathen. But, you know, I, I'm selective in what I watch. Because I, I don't want to, you know, God brought me out of that lifestyle when I was cussing and chasing and all that, those things. Don't do those things anymore. But yet, you can't even escape the sexual in a, intonations in the, the commercials. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. It's, it ain't getting better, folks. We're getting close to those times that Paul was going through. Verse 48, now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread through all the region. Let's go back to 1 Timothy. Verse 11 of 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy, sorry. Chapter 1 says, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. And that was his primary ministry after that. 
He would go into the synagogues on the Sabbath and preach if they let him. Sometimes they kicked him out. He didn't like his stuff. And see, he had credentials in the Jewish community. You have to remember that. Of all the apostles, he was the best educated, both in the Gentile world. He's a Roman citizen, so he, he learned Roman law. And he was also schooled in Judaism at the feet of the greatest rabbi of his day at Jerusalem. I always mispronounce the name, but I'll just... It's Gamaliel. Gamaliel. <laughs> I pronounce it the easy way for me to say it. Say it again. Gamaliel. Gamaliel, yeah. Okay, same guy. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, he, he was a giant in his day. And so Paul had learned from him. So he knew Jewish law. And he knew Roman law. And so when they called him to task and arrested him, he would defend himself in their courts and blew their minds. Amen. But Paul was more than a student of the scripture. He became the scripture. Amen. He became the scripture. He saturated himself in it. I saw a little YouTube presentation last night. I'm familiar with this man's ministry. I don't agree with everything he teaches, but nevertheless, he is an outstanding teacher, John MacArthur Jr. He has a huge church in Sun City, California. He's been around a long time. Right now, he's suffering an illness, so he's not in the pulpit all the time. That saddens me, because Pastor John's really good. And I didn't really realize this till this uh, video that I saw. He teaches verse by verse, like we do in Calvary Chapel. I didn't know that. Uh, anyway, so John MacArthur Jr. is just, just an outstanding teacher. And uh, for this reason, verse 12, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day, Amen. till the day of the Lord, when he finally wraps everything up. Amen. Verse 13, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know, verse 15, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Nisiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. This runaway slave sought Paul out in his first imprisonment and got saved. He heard about his reputation apparently, and so he went to find Paul when he escaped from his master, a man named Philemon. But we'll see in Philemon where Paul sends a letter to Philemon. That's what it's all about, Paul's letter to him. Take this kid back. He's a different kid. He became saved under my ministry. I'm going to send him back at my expense, and you bring him into your household, but don't treat him as a slave. Treat him as a brother in the Lord. He'll be a valuable asset to you. And I'm paraphrasing that very loosely. But it's a touching little letter to Philemon, a personal letter, where Paul pours his heart out on behalf of this runaway slave. And uh, Philemon was a believer in Jesus, so uh, things got patched up from that, that runaway. But in the running away, he met Paul. That's cool. You know, God set that up. It was wrong in that culture that he ran away from his master. Jews were told not to mistreat their servants or their slaves. They had pretty strict rules about that. They didn't always because they're human, but still, nevertheless, they didn't treat them as slaves like we know slaves have been treated in our country and around the world. But nevertheless, he encouraged him. Don't. 
He, he's a brother in Jesus now. He's part of us. And he's valuable to you in your ministry. Hold fast, verse, three, first, verse 13, chapter 2, chapter 1, <laughs> second Timothy. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. How many times has he mentioned Jesus in this chapter? I didn't count it. I should have. Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ. He, he turns them around, but they, it's the same thing. He's really bearing down on the fact that Jesus is the man. A good thing, verse 14, which is committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household in Nisiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. He wasn't ashamed that Paul was a prisoner. When he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. Boy, that might have been a chore. He's on foot. He's a runaway. How did he find Paul? Huh? Big city. Yeah. And hostility against Christians. How did he find Paul? It was a divine appointment. God set it up, man. He knew what that kid needed, what he wanted. Lord grant him, verse 18, that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. In this little portion of this short letter, there's so much there. But God has our future planned out for us. And he knows what each of us is going to suffer for the sake of our following him. Some are going to suffer more than others. You know, there's so many scriptures that Paul says, what's the first Corinthians 10, 13, I think it is. And it's floating away now into the atmosphere. Uh, don't think, I'm paraphrasing, don't think the trial that you're going through is something that's not common to mankind. But it says God is faithful. That he's able to give you, and I'm paraphrasing this now very loosely, he's able to give you the stuff to go through that at trial without giving up on the Lord. Amen. That he'll give you a way to bear up under it, yes. to bear the pressure, to handle it. I'm going to wrap up this chapter by going to Hebrews chapter 11, please. To your right now. I would like to speak like some do in our culture, that how as Christians we can become so spiritual we don't suffer. Some of the finest Christians I've ever known have suffered tremendously Amen. in the natural and physical. There are those that haven't suffered for their faith. It's both things, folks. We don't know which one we're going to be in, what class. How are we going to handle it? First of all, or chapter 11 of Hebrews is what we call the Hall of Faith. The great people of the past, men and women, 
They had great trust in Jesus Christ. Verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. That, that, that's an amazing miracle when you think about it. How many of you like veggie tales? They're kind of passe now, but man, they were popular at one time. And th those are cool, man, I'm telling you. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, the, the walls of Jericho, it's, it's, it's really funny the way they, they did that. The, the people at Jericho are French people. They have this French accent. And they're up there on the wall and they're jumping up and down and they're making fun of the Jews with that French accent. <laughs> I'm cracking up, man. But you know, that was an impossibility, what happened there. Yeah, God's hand was in it. They, they marched seven days around it and then they shouted and the walls fell down. The skeptics of the day that don't believe the Bible to be true, they say, well, they, they caused so much noise and commotion and the shaking of the ground that it became like an earthquake and the walls fell down. You see, the non-believer will try to find anything not to believe a miracle. Amen. You and I, if we've been Christians very long, we've been around long enough, we've seen miracles. True, true miracles. Amen. So Rahab, by faith, verse 31, did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. She took her own life in her hands against her own people. So she's in the hall of faith and she's in Jesus' lineage. That's cool stuff, man. And what more shall I say, verse 32, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. They were all victorious in battle and so on. Who through faith, verse 33, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Wasn't David killed a lion with his bare hands? Yeah. Yeah. Now, he wasn't a giant of a guy, you know. When he faced Goliath, he was just a little short guy, comparatively. Goliath was nine foot tall. David had guts, man. He, he trusted the Lord. He, he wasn't afraid of that giant, remember? Amen. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that's mocking our God? So he picks up some stones. He goes out to meet this joker. Yeah, yeah, they, they, you know, David, David was a warrior king, you know. <laughs> and so then Goliath, you know, he's used to intimidating everybody. He's laughing, and then all of a sudden, he's on the ground. He don't know it. He's dead. Yeah, yeah. Dave was an expert slingshot. Boom. Hit him between the eyes. <laughs> Cut his head off with his own sword. David had to be pretty strong because that sword was a big old sword. But the, the point is that David was enabled by God to do those miraculous feats of courage. These people quenched the violence of fire, verse 34, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, uh, turned, to, turned to flight to armies of the aliens. They chased them out. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others, it shifts now from those that are success, successful in, in turning back to enemies. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. That's crazy, man. These people were loco. Yeah. Still others had a trial of mockings and scourging, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. Paul knew about that. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. I circled that in my Bible. The world's not worthy of those that willingly gave their lives 
for the sake of the gospel. They wandered in deserts and mountains, John the Baptist, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, verse 39, having been obtained a good testimony through faith, Amen. did not receive the promise. Check that out. They did that, and they didn't see the end of their faith. They won't see it till we're all resurrected together. Do you know that? We don't deserve to be in that number, but we are. Pretty cool stuff, folks. We don't deserve to be there, but we are. Verse 40, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Wow. That's strong stuff, man. They went through all that mess, and they're not going to see the true salvation from all that till later when we're all resurrected together. And we don't deserve that, man. Maybe we ought to pray that we get cut in two. I'm kidding. Are you with me there? Let's pray. I have a note here on a card, no name. I will be going to have surgery to have a pacemaker installed. I appreciate prayers. Thank you. We don't have to have a name. God knows. Amen. Let's pray for this, this brother or sister. Holy Father, Lord, pacemakers, they do a good thing. You, you've given the medical community the, the ability to invent these things that are helpful for our, our survival. Oh, God, grant that brother or sister that that will work and preserve their life Just this more days and pray that they'll use the life that's preserved for your benefit, Lord, to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus.